All right, welcome in. This is Winning Cures Everything. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. There he is. <laughs> so we're having to do this uh, through our Zoom recorder today. Uh, we are both uh, working remotely. So uh, the show, as always, brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They've got six incredible sports books. You can find more information on them over at tunicatravel.com. Chris, you and I will be at uh, Samstown Casino in Tunica, March 21st, March 22nd. It's the first two days of the NCAA tournament. We are going to have an absolute blast. We're spending the night there. Uh, I could not be looking more forward to this. How about you? I'm excited, man. I mean, this is my favorite weekend of, of, of college basketball, at least. And, oh, yeah. Uh, one of the best weekends of the year. Uh, you have got that right. Uh, I've already gotten confirmation from uh, people from Oklahoma, South Carolina, and from Texas that have gotten their rooms. They are coming to Sam's Town to hang out with us. Uh, a couple of the guys normally go out to Vegas, and they're changing it up, and they're coming to Sam's Town in Tunica to hang out with us. So we want to see the rest of you guys there. Come on, hang out. TunicaTravel.com for more information on what you can do while you're here if you're traveling in town. Uh, I, I'm, again, I cannot look more forward to this. Uh, taking the days off work, we're going to be down there all day. We're spending the night. It's going to be a good time. Uh, Chris, we're going to do some college football and NFL uh, just kind of back and forth today. That sound good? Come on. And so episode 270, we've, uh, we've been doing this a long time. Really, really long time. Uh, and as we have figured out, college football season and NFL season are never actually over. So let's go on and jump in. Uh, something that came up after we recorded last week, Miami and Florida are playing in, in, in the opening weekend next, uh, next year or I guess this season, uh, it's supposed to be August 31st. They are moving or discussing moving the game to August 24th. Yeah, uh, week zero. Week zero. Yeah. Now, it, the, the way that you could do it in the past was you had to be playing Hawaii or it had to be like overseas or something like that. Well, this game is in Orlando, but it is part of ESPN's uh, college football 150th anniversary organization deal uh i i don't know how i feel about this there is a rule against playing before labor day weekend unless you've got one of those two things overseas or hawaii uh how do you feel about this well first let's address the rule and let's talk about how i feel about rules <laughs> why is the rule in place I just want to know what is so, the purpose of this rule. So that it's even for everybody because what this basically does is provide – so Florida and Miami would get to start fall practice earlier than everybody else, okay. and they would get another bye week, right? So that's, yeah, but that's multiple, a, conference, multiple conferences have two bye weeks. Well, but everybody this year has two bye weeks, and this so would give them a third. Yeah, but their second bye week is week one, right? Right. That's not really a bye week. What a, I'm curious about the schedule. I, I don't um, care. I, I, give me football as soon as you can give me football. You know how we're feeling. When we get into August, I mean, it is, it is like a hardcore addict that is just needs their fix. No, oh, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I just I – don't, I don't care. You know, do, do it as early as you can possibly do it. Oh, so they get to start practice a week earlier than everybody else? Who cares? No, I'm I'm with you. These I'm are with two you. programs that are, I want to say, going in different directions, but maybe they're in the exact same place, just in a little different way. Second year with Willie Taggart after a complete disaster. Well, not not Willie Taggart, uh, oh. uh, Manny Diaz. Manny Diaz, so, Mark Rick. First year, first first year with Manny Diaz. Yeah. First year with Diaz. Second year with uh, Mullins, right? Correct. And uh, you know we're kind of trying to figure out where these two programs are in the scheme of college football. Now, the only thing – so Florida in their second week plays Tennessee Martin. So not really an advantage there. You expect them to handle them anyway. Uh, where it does make a difference is Florida – I'm sorry, Miami has to go to North Carolina on September 7th. It is so, strange that they have a league game, a uh, conference game, that early in the season. Yeah, and North Carolina plays South Carolina in Charlotte the week before that. 
So part of it, man. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I feel. I'm I mean, I'm if down. Miami with played it. a high school team. Would anybody care? Not if they really. Played Florida Correctional. Like, would anybody care? No. I think it'd, it'd kind of be the same thing, right? Because you, yeah. you get a lot of scrubs in the game. You, yeah. UNC yeah. UNC is actually playing a, a real school before them, and that's just how the schedule works out sometimes. I yeah. don't think this is an unfair thing for anybody. And and give me football, and and let's let it not be, you know, political. Hawaii versus Maine. All right. That, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I need my fix of football, and I'm getting the worst possible football I could get. Yeah, it's now this week. Typically, in the past, uh, has been a week that Division two schools get a chance to kind of showcase because people are so starved that they will watch anything. We'll watch it. Uh, we will. I will watch anything. I mean, I, I I have sat up, you know, past one o'clock in the morning watching Stanford and Rice from Sydney, Australia. Before I was just about to say so, that Stanford Rice game that we got. That's horrible. That's yeah, a bad was, game. It was a bad game, and, and college football is upset that we don't get to give you a bat. So, if, if you play week zero, it has to be a terrible game. Why can't it be a good game? Well, I think that's what they're trying to do for the, the college football 150th anniversary, and I'm in with it. So, oh, I, I say bring it on, let's go. Any good football, I'll take. I am with you. Uh, next topic up, Nick Starkle, transferring from Texas A&M to Arkansas – He's got two years remaining. He is immediately eligible. He's a graduate transfer. Uh, the issue there is that SMU's Ben Hicks, who played for uh, Chad Morris at SMU for three seasons, uh, he was the starter at SMU for three years, and he's already transferred to Arkansas. It, does this seem like a good idea for Starkle if he wants to play right away? The meritocracy, man. If he thinks he's better than Hicks, get in there. Take it. In, Hey, I'm I'm with you. I'm, I'm going to tell you this: Starkle and our Hicks are 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 probably going to be holding up the Heisman. I think that trophy is anybody's. It's <laughs> it, it's not like one of them went to Alabama to try to take Tua's job. Like you, you don't know that that other guy's better than you. Agreed. Then you mix it up. Right now, he knows he's not going to play at A and M. Yeah, Kellen Mond is yeah. is the guy. He's he's got the answer there. So let me leave and let me say, you know what? I can. I think I can take that job, and I still get in the Power Five. I don't go ha- have to go to a, a, a subdivision. We still call them subdivisions, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, like I, I don't have to drop down a level. I can stay in the SEC. I can stay in the South, and uh, and yeah, I just I just move over. You know, one state. I'm surprised that there hasn't been more, uh, not outrage, but at least more talk about the fact that. These are division rivals. I mean, if Starkle gets the job, it's him against Kellen Mond, and that could be really entertaining to watch. Now, obviously, I don't think Arkansas is on Texas A&M's level right now, but it'll at least be interesting if for no other reason than Starkle still believes that he's better than Kellen Mond, and you know he's going to put everything into that ballgame. So you use the word outrage, and I use the word excitement. This is why I think it's ridiculous that schools can can um, block other kids because well I don't want I don't want to start this guy but I also don't want to play against him no screw that let him go to a school you didn't want him let him go play somewhere else and if you got to play him once every year tough beat yeah. him you didn't think he was good enough to start for you beat him I agree. I, I, I'm actually excited that he gets to play against a team. But the reason I bring up – rarely term, get that. The reason I bring up the term outrage is more or less because of the old guard, right? The people that want things done the way they've always been done for no other reason than that's the they've way they've always, always been, been done. Way. Once again, so, rule, rules with no, no principle, no direction, no purpose. They're just a rule to have a rule. I agree. I'm with you. Uh, and in, in this case, we didn't have to worry about anything. So, Jimbo nope. didn't try and block him. No, nope. like graduate no. transfer, Jimbo wasn't worried about it, did the right thing. Well, I know Jimbo's got some skeletons in his closet from the Jameis Winston time at Florida State. He, yeah. he is not without flaw or without judgment. I, I still find him very likable. I, I, oh, I don't know why I give him a pass, but I find him likable. Oh, I, I'm with you. I agree. I agree 100%. Um, Let's talk about North Carolina's senior quarterback, Nathan Elliott. He's leaving North Carolina. You know, Mac Brown just took over for Larry Fedora. 
Uh, Nathan Elliott started, I think, 10 out of 12 games last year. Uh, he did not start the last game. He is leaving North Carolina not to transfer and play somewhere. He is going to Arkansas State to be a graduate assistant because he wants to get into coaching. There you go. You think this is a smart move, or should he maybe have stuck around with Mac for another year and then taken a graduate assistant position elsewhere? All right, A, you never waste time. As soon as you know your the, – the, one of my number one rules for life is as soon as you know you're holding a losing hand, you fold it. Okay. Um, and, and so I think he realizes I'm not going to do football forever, and I, don't, I, I'm, I lost this job. I don't want to be a backup. I'd rather start preparing myself for, for life without football and what I want to do. So what's better to learn from? The Arkansas State coaching staff, which I don't know about this coach and the coaching staff. No, he took him to a bowl game, whatever. Well, I mean, Blake Anderson is, has been really no, good. There. Name, that's right. He's been good, and his name's going to get floated around for bigger jobs. Or Mac Brown, like the life of old times past. If he wants to learn to be a politician in a college town, then, yeah, hang out with Mac Brown and try to learn. If you want to learn X's and O's and how football is played at the college level, then, yeah, go somewhere else. He likes the people at Arkansas State. Don't know if he's going to have a connection there or anything like that. But I mean, he's got to have some kind of connection if they offered him a, a GA spot. A GA spot, yeah. But, but it could just be as simple as, I like this guy's resume and I want to learn under him. If you think that guy is on the fast track up to get a next big job, maybe you get carried with him when he does that. Maybe you've got a job as a position coach. And, and this is how careers are built. I don't think staying with – I'm. I'm going to be very rude and inappropriate by saying this. I don't know a nice way to say it. Staying with a dinosaur like Mac Brown is not going to help catapult your career anywhere. I think I, I, think I agree Brown, with you. Mac Brown is sitting in a 401K. He's sitting at a place strictly to retire. That's it. I, okay. I can get that. I can get that. Uh, I do want to bring up a question that was brought up online, uh, not to us. It was to another podcast. Uh, if Cliff Kingsbury is successful in year one in the NFL, does Mike Leach's stock rise not only in college football with like power five jobs and whatnot, but also maybe in the NFL? All right. Now, how successful do people running that system that, that he has been doing for a long time have to be for people to actually take notice? Because if you look at college football and now the NFL – the, the coaching tree that has come from Mike Leach, whether they worked for him and or just learned under him and never actually worked for him in a running his style of, of, of offense the way he always has, I, I don't know what else he can do or what else those people can do to show you, you can, this can win football. This can be winning football. Well, in the last two years, he's also shown, like, you can have a good defense with this offense as well. That's right. That's absolutely so, right. And, that's, and with an undersized, you know, undermanned defense. No, no talent yeah. at all on the national level. If you look at recruiting-wise, when he was in Lubbock and, and now at Bowman, he, he's not getting top 10 recruiting classes in the country. He's not getting top 20. Yeah, he's winning by scheme. That's right. He's just out coaching them. I've said it forever. If a big boy school ever picked him up, it would be scary. I agree with you. I agree. When, when Les was gone, you know there was nobody I wanted more than him. I wonder if the NFL is worried about the, the political statements that he would make. Like, I think that's, that's his biggest problem. I just think that's ridiculous, and you know how I feel about that. Oh, I know. We hire him to coach football games, man. And we hire players to play football. And if, yeah. you get your political, if you're getting your political information from athletes and or coaches, then that's on you. And yeah, I don't know. A problem. I, I can't fix that problem you have. But if you listen to somebody who plays a game for a living and let them tell you how you should feel about a political subject, whether it be conservative or liberal or, or moderate or whatever, then that's totally on you for not doing your own research and, and not looking your own stuff up. I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that or address that. For people to not hire somebody to win football games because they think he might say the wrong things politically. Look, as long as he's not saying anything offensive, that's, that's openly real offensive and not made up fake offensive, 
I just think that's ridiculous. But well, see, we never have a problem with athletes doing it, right? Like that—that that never becomes an issue. Oh no, people have a problem. I mean, did you watch the NFL the last two years? Well, no, but but I'm talking about NFL teams. It's not like they're not going to sign somebody based on their political beliefs. Oh well, I don't know. I think I think Colin Kaepernick got a lot of money because of that. Okay, it, based on okay. Kaepernick aside, because – You can't say Kaepernick like aside. It's not like any other coaches aren't getting a job either. Kaepernick was an extreme. People see Mike Leach as an extreme. That, okay. And here's what Mike Leach is, that, that, and you can't really compare him to Kaepernick because they're not the same thing at all. Mike Leach is – you can't control Mike Leach. And that's the thing that I think these owners are scared of or athletic directors are scared of. They want a coach that can win football games – but they also want somebody they can control and you can't control Lee. That's it. That's the one thing you can't predict what he's going to do and you can't control anything about him. He's going to do what Kingsbury right. is. He, he's off of that leech tree. So he knows the offense pretty well, but he is easily controllable. He's a, yeah, he's, a pretty he's, face. He's super young. He's a pretty yeah. face. You can you can put him in a press conference and win that press conference pretty easily and yeah. I don't know. I think you can win Mike Leach's press conferences as well. <laughs> well, it depends on what you want. I mean, do you that's want somebody to attract attention to yourself, or do you want somebody that's just going to look pretty and say all the right answers? All right. The uh, the NCAA Playing Rules Oversight Panel is meeting on April seventeenth. I'm going to go through a list of what they are actually meeting about. Okay, here are the four main proposals that they're going to talk about. Okay. Uh, one, the overtime change. Now, you and I have talked privately about this. Uh, alternating two-point uh, possessions after four overtimes. So once you reach the fifth overtime, it is alternating two-point tries, and you do that until you get a winner. That's right. One play from the two-yard line. Bam. Basically, penalty kicks in college football. How do you, how do you feel about this? Not, I completely disagree with that. Completely disagree with that. Running a play and kicking a penalty kick is totally different. You Agreed. still need all 11 members of offense and all 11 members of defense. Okay. I, I'm with only you. You're better, taking out of special teams. That's it. You're only taking and, – and the college overtime already takes special teams out of it except for the extra point and the field goal try. Well, after you get – I mean, once you get past the third overtime you – Yeah, you've taken you're the extra trying point. for extra points either. Yeah. But you can still get so, – so I don't care. They took special teams out of it. You get one play, bam, in and out, there you go. If you get it and the next team doesn't, you win. I'm totally, I wonder – I, I wonder if – I wonder if three. I want them to do it after three overtimes. These games are too damn long in college. And, and if you care about player safety at all – and, and also, we don't have a lot of four, five overtime games. Most of no, them are – we've, we've had five five overtime games in the last five seasons. Five so, years. we average one yeah. per year. I want to see this happen every other weekend. I'd be cool with it. Because I think it's a, a cool way to end the game. And then, B, you're just – what's happening when you get LSU, A&M at the end of those games? The true best team is not winning that game. The lucky team is because both teams are just dog-ass tired. And you can't say the team that wins was more in shape. No, they're both exhausted beyond belief. It yeah. just all bounced a certain way, and one team got it and the other team didn't. Yeah. I mean, have, uh, in the LSU A&M all, game, which is what Prompton saw back in the day, it seems to yep. be almost every other year. Um, <laughs> you know, like, like – that, I can't tell you the teams that win those games are truly the better team that gets the, the W by their name. I agree. I mean, once you get into overtime, it's it's just a crapshoot. That's right. Like, it's it's lucky plays. It's if you're going to do whatever. that, let's get in and out of this thing. Let's get it over with. Let's get a winner. Let's make it exciting, and boom, you're out of there. All right, so you would rather it be uh, after three overtime. I want it after three. After. I want the fourth overtime. We're starting this thing. Hey, let's roll with it. I'm, I'm down. Uh, the I'm next one. Three. Second targeting penalty in a season will result in ejection and suspension for the entire next game. So rather than – now, I think they are uh, – they're going in and they're going to let everybody review uh, after the game and whatnot and make sure – because there's only so much you can see in uh, 30 to 60 seconds, right? Like sometimes it's not as clear cut as, as you would like for it to be. Yep. Uh, but they're going to go in and review after games to see if it was a, a targeting – that warranted an ejection uh, for, like, the next game, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to do a better job of that. 
because they haven't been – this year with Devin White against Mississippi State when he was out for the first half against Alabama, yep. um, you could not go back and review it to see if it warranted a suspension for the first half against Alabama. Now you can go back and review that after the game and determine whether or not they are supposed to be out for the next game, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, here's my question about that. I do have a question about how this rule is going to actually take an effect. Okay. So I get, I get the second one, you're out for the next game if it stands all in all. What happens if it's your second one and it's like the fourth quarter of the game you're in? Are you out for a game and a half? Do you still miss that half game? They, they only said that you are suspended for the entire Almost. next game. Okay. So the, so way that it, the way that it was set up before, if it's in the second half, uh, then it would be the rest of that game and the first half of the next game, That's right? right? Half so next game. with Devin White, it was in the fourth quarter against Mississippi State, and that got him out for the first half of the Alabama game. Now it would be for the entire – whether it's first quarter, fourth quarter, doesn't matter. Uh, you would still be out for the entire next game if it is your second offense. Okay. So, how do you feel about that? I guess my question is if it's your first offense – I don't care. I don't have a problem with that rule. I don't have a problem with that rule. You're trying to get targeting out of the game, and, and I'm absolutely okay with it. I like the idea that you can review it because there are some times where – man, they make the call in the field and they're going to always lean on the side of protecting the players. And I'm yeah. understanding that, but some of these calls, Devin White wasn't the only one that are just, there's, it just wasn't it just wrong. It just, yeah, they just got it wrong on the field. And for him to miss the last three minutes of that game, no big deal. Okay. If it was a game that was tight and going into overtime and you lose that game, I get it. Somebody made a knee jerk call, a reaction, a bang, bang call. They reviewed it the best they could there. Don't penalize the team the second game. Well, like I said, there's only so much you can see in a replay in 30 to 60 seconds, right? Totally agree. So the fact that they're allowing them to review it and and actually look and see does the extra suspension – is the extra suspension warranted? I'm totally okay with saying you're a multiple-time offender and this is going against you and you're out the whole game. Well, and it not not just for that, but like on your first offense – you know, if it's in the third quarter or fourth quarter, you would be out for the first half of the next game. I think that they've got, even got it where um, – and they're going to talk about this April 17th and whatnot, but if it's in the first half of a game, the re, uh, replay officials will go in and kind of research it more and review it more to see whether or not they're allowed to come out in the second half or not. Oh, okay. So, I'm good with that. Yeah, they're – I mean, they, they, they will be reviewing it a lot. A – on the field if they didn't really do anything wrong, back on the field as quickly as possible. But also, B, if they did, we feel better about standing behind the call. Yes. And I'm okay with the punishments. I just – I'm not scared of them. I agree. I agree. Uh, The next one, elimination of the two-man wedge blocking during kickoff returns. Uh, That's just a player safety thing. So, that'll be a 15-yard penalty – I think think with the invention of the aft, we're going to see kickoffs go go by the way of the dodo in the next five years. I I think you're probably right on that. And I don't think I'm – like, before I was like, man, it's a part of the game, and yada, yada, this and another. And now I'm watching this aft league. I don't miss it at all. No, the AAF is actually – Hey, we stopped the ball, and we got more football. Let's just get back to playing, baby. Yeah, get back to playing. I'm good with it. I, I am too. I'm totally okay with it. And if you're a high-powered offense against some soft defense, I'm going to tell you this. If, if you're a typical – I'm using typical because the Big 12 is getting better defensively. But if you're a typical old-school offensive team, you take the ball in the first half on, on, on kickoff or whatever, however you win the coin toss, you always take the ball because this could be make it, take it. You just, oh, yeah. you, you just go for the fourth and 18 every time or whatever you start as the onside kick option, and you just you just make it, take it. We're just going to keep the ball, and you're just never going to get it back. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the way it goes. So, I think initially it was uh, it, it was basically like a fourth and ten play. Uh, it's, it's technically fourth and 12. So, you got to get 12 yards on a play. But if you feel good enough in your offense that you can do that, I, I think there's a lot of – I think there's a lot of teams that feel confident about getting 12 yards. I agree. I agree. I think it'd be great. 
Uh, last one for the playing rules oversight panel, uh, a rule that they are going to look at. Blindside block with forcible contact is now a 15-yard penalty. So it doesn't matter if it's a block in the back. If it is a blindside block where the other guy doesn't see you uh, and, and it is basically violent. More special team scoring is what's going to happen. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what this looks like. Yeah, because it's really hard to – I mean, the defenders are running – it's one of the rare opportunities where – the defender, and I'm trying to make sure my fingers, they're going in opposite directions, the person blocking you and the person you're blocking. And the chance they're going after the ball, you're going after as a blocker, the person, and they don't know that you exist. Right. Well, really, this would, this would be less special team scoring. No, I think this is going to heavily influence the offenses. Because I think really? defenses, yeah, I think the defenders are going to have to be um, – well, because it's not the defenders that are. Oh, well, yes, you're right. No. Yeah, it, it would be less special team scoring because it's it's the yeah. defenders that have been the ones getting blindside blocked. That's right. You're right. So I'm I'm curious. I to maybe see. this rule would make the defenses a little less aggressive, but it's, no, it's going to be really tough to enforce. Uh, but I guess it, it it says with forcible contact. So I guess it's a judgment call on how vicious the hit is, right? right. I That's mean, the exactly the most. What I want to do. Take people who are bad at their job and allow them not only to be bad at the job, but also bad at decision making. Yeah. Well, the the most noticeable one that that I can remember off the top of my head was uh, was when Aaron Murray threw a, a pick for Georgia again. And this is years ago, of course. I think 2012. Uh, but when Aaron Murray threw that interception against Alabama and got absolutely waylaid, I don't know if you remember that or not. But it, it wasn't. It was a blindside block, but it wasn't, you know, a block in the back. It wasn't illegal. There was no helmet-to-helmet contact, but Murray never saw it coming. He was a defensive player trying to kill a quarterback because he had an opportunity to take a free shot on a quarterback. Yeah. It was a cheap cheap shot. Agreed. Now, there was nothing illegal about it back then. I mean, it's dirty. But, no, it was absolutely dirty. I'm with you. And I think that's what they're trying to do is, is get dirty hits out of the game. That's right. I agree with that. I'm okay with that. I'm yeah, right with that. I'm, I'm good with that as well. None of these rules I'm upset about, and several of them I'm really excited about. I really want that OT rule. I, I agree. OTs, and as soon as you would normally make them go for twos, now you're just going for two. You get one play in the ball. The other team gets one play in the ball. We're out of here. Yep. Let, let's not do 207 plays in a game like, nope. uh, like LSU and, and A&M. Uh, uh, nope. I do want to bring up – so, Bruce Feldman and Stuart Mandel over at the uh, Athletic, they did their top 25 college football coaches. Now, they do this ranking, I think, every year. Mm-hmm. And did you see this list today? I did not. I wish I'd have looked at it beforehand, having no one were talking about it. All right. So, at the re- I'm, I'm bringing it up because the two were so completely different. Like, it was just mind-boggling. I'll go through the top ten for each one, Okay. Okay. Uh, Stuart Mandel, he's got Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney, 1A and 1B. He's got Peterson, 3, Chris Peterson at Washington, Lincoln Riley, 4, Brian Kelly, number 5, Kirby Smart, 6, Jimbo Fisher, 7, Mike Leach, 8, Gary Patterson, 9, and then David Shaw, 10. Uh, and, and one to grow on, out, he's got Jeff Monken from Army at 11. Uh, Bruce Feldman, he has got – the same top four, only he's got Dabo Sweeney two. He's got Saban one. He said he's the best coach in college football history. Uh, one blowout loss in the national championship doesn't change that. Uh, but Saban one, Sweeney two, Peterson three, Riley four. He's got Jimbo Fisher at five. James Franklin at Penn State number six. Chip Kelly at UCLA number seven. Gary Patterson at eight. Brian Kelly at nine. Mike Leach ten. And then he's got Jim Harbaugh at 11. Okay. How do you how do you feel about these two lists? I like Bruce's better. Um, you just know I, I, I don't argue with ninety percent of it. I would have Leach substantially higher. I think if Leach got to coach the quality of talent that the other guys coach, this would not even be close. But a major part of coaching is recruiting, and you know he's just always going to be at a school that. So right now, his resume is at schools where you just can't recruit. Yeah. Um, I would absolutely have 
Jim Harbaugh in both lists, and there's no way on earth that I would have David Shaw in the top ten. We've been through this, in my opinion, of that. It's yep. my opinion, one man's opinion. Um, he's a good coach. He's not a great coach. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think they've got most of them. I really like that both of them have Chris Peterson so high. Um, you know how I feel about him. Uh, I, I think he deserves to be up there. Um, I, don't, I don't know. And I'm trying to not have recency bias with Chip Kelly. Uh, you know how much I loved him. I was all in with him at Oregon. Well, I, yeah. I mean, at, 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 not Oregon. Yeah, I was at Oregon. But also when he went to the Eagles – I was just more all in than I could possibly be um, and uh, just left wanting. He wasn't as bad as people make him out to be. Still made the playoffs, you know, more than he didn't. Um, and then just took over a train wreck in 49ers. Recency bias has me questioning that. I need to see him get back into college football and be better. I agree. He, he's got to be better than what he was. I don't hate either list, and I can't think of anybody they left off outside of Harbaugh's name. I would have Harbaugh higher, and I would, I would not have Shaw on the first list, and I would have Harbaugh on that one. Mandel doesn't even have Harbaugh in his top 26. That's, that's, just, that's just ridiculous. I mean, that's uh, I'll go on and I'll read you the rest of them real quick. Uh, Mandel has got Bill Clark, number 12, uh, Dan Mullen, 13, Mark D'Antonio, 14, James Franklin, 15, Tom Herman, 16, Pat Fitzgerald, 17, Mike Gundy, 18, Dino Babers at 19, uh, David Cutcliffe, 20, Matt Campbell, 21, Jeff Brom, 22, Kyle Winningham, 23, Mark Stoops at 24, and then Scott Frost, 25, and Chip Kelly at 25B. You so, can't, can't even get my boy Orger on the list. Uh, he's, so here's Feldman's, the rest of Feldman. Uh, he's got Harbaugh at 11. He's got Kirby Smart, 12, David Shaw, 13, Dino Babers, 14, Matt Campbell, 15, Pat Fitzgerald, 16, which I don't know how Mandel doesn't have Pat Fitzgerald on this list. Um, totally agree. Uh, 16, Pat Fitzgerald, 17, Kyle Whittingham, 18, Tom Herman, 19, Jeff Munkin from Army, 20, David Cutcliffe, 21, Mark D'Antonio, 22, Scott Frost, 23, Mike Gundy, 24, Dan Mullen, and then 25, A, Jeff Brom, 25, B, Matt Rule. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a couple of names out there that, that weren't on both lists and a couple of names that jumped on there. You know, Babers yeah. has got to be higher on both lists. I think Matt Rule, in my opinion, Matt Rule has got to be higher on both of those. Um, you know, I love, love, love that one of them had Bill Clark. Can't believe both of them don't have Bill Clark. Well, it, but, it was Feldman that oh, had Bill Clark at, uh, or no, Mandel that had Bill Clark at 12. That's right. It, it, you cannot look at his resume over the last however many years and not say he belongs up there. Yep. You just can't do it. Not until now, if he ever gets the power five job and completely fails at that power five jobs, then yeah, he doesn't deserve to be on the list. But right now, what we've seen of him and how he can coach and build what he's built, there's just no arguing. I mean it he had to rebuild his roster from complete scratch. From nothing, with with no talent at all. And and then won eight games his first year and then won a program record. 11 games and a conference championship in his second year. And a bowl game. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, mean, what else do you want him to do? <laughs> you got me. You absolutely got me. I'm begging uh, let's, him to get an SEC job. That's all I want. Let's move into NFL, like a little NFL combine. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with a few questions, and then I know you've got some stuff that, that you want to talk about as well. Okay. Um, first off, let, this has nothing to do with combine, whatever. Johnny Menzel last week. Cut, kicked out of the CFL. He's talking to the AAF. Uh, my question to you is, is he ever going to make an NFL roster again? No. Is that, it's pretty easy, right? I think it's easy, but I do think he'll make one of these other spring leagues. Well, because he, he's a moneymaker. Yeah. Like well, he, and he I think he's got – it's not just a moneymaker. He right now would be the best quarterback in the AF. He, he just would. I, I mean, well, I don't know. I hadn't really seen him play much in, in the last no, – I, I haven't either, but listen, I just watched Hackenberg play for three weeks, and he just threw a ball over himself. Now, yeah. I know he's lost his job to Menberger, but it doesn't matter. Like, I've seen some of the quarterback play. Aaron Murray finally got a start in Atlanta, looked good. But the guys that they were rolling out there to try to start some of these teams, 
Yeah, they were bad. Really bad. A real yeah. bad quarterback position. No, I'll, I'll say this: I, Garrett I Gilbert in Orlando, he yeah. he looked pretty good for Spurrier, well, uh, and then Lewis Perez at. I at think if Birmingham. you take any of the quarterbacks on any of these rosters and you move them to Orlando, I think they're going to look pretty good. You're I've watched right. Spurrier make make some some pretty average guys look pretty amazing. Yeah, I think I think you're probably right on that. <laughs> That's, that is my boy right there, man. That's my guy. All right, so so Johnny Football, uh, man, could you imagine him with with Spurrier? Well, he'd be with San Antonio. So I don't know, I know based it's on, based on the way they do things, which is I, fine. I do wonder if he will end up in the AAF or if he's more of Vince McMahon's kind of guy. I mean, if Vince McMahon sticks to the we ain't taking anybody who's ever been arrested thing, then Johnny don't get to go. Yeah, I guess you're probably right on that. I, I doubt that he sticks to that. I, mean, I just I can't see it. He's gonna have a hard time filling a roster. Not I mean. Not saying that all football players are thugs, but everybody's got a little trouble in the past. Hey, you got so. that right. Uh, my next question to you, uh, this is – and after this one, I've got one combine question. Uh, is Antonio Brown hurting himself? Like, yep. what, what is his next team, and, and what can Pittsburgh get for him? All right, well, so my opinions on Antonio Brown is they, if he shuts up and says nothing and they agree to trade him – I think he's already traded now, and I actually think he has a little bit of leverage to say to the Steelers, hey, I I did good for you. Don't don't send me to Siberia. You know what I'm saying? What tell and, me this. In the NFL, what would Siberia be? Uh the Bills. Okay. Right now, um, you know, maybe Arizona, unless they turn things around. Um I don't know. I mean, that, it's could you, always. Could you imagine A. B. with Kyler Murray in Arizona? Who? Well, what they got to give to get. I mean, they're obviously not going to trade the number one overall, but well, no. And I think I do think he has hurt his value um, to a point where. So there's there's a couple of things going on here that that people have have thrown out about about the situation. If he's as toxic as you think he is, and as he's kind of showing to be. Are you afraid to trade him to a rival at all? Because because I don't know that I'd be scared to send him to Cincinnati. That could be Siberia, by the way. That's it. You, you're right about oh. that. <laughs> yeah. So, but but like I don't know that I'd be afraid to say, oh, this would upset me. I don't want this to happen the way he's kind of been acting. Um, like I, it's hard to say I wouldn't want this to happen. But like the Browns are trying to get a new culture, a new thing, and everyone's like, well, there's no way that they'd trade him in the division. If you think he's the cancer that he is and you got this upstart team kind of on the rise, man, throw him a cancer. Maybe he'll maybe he'll wreck it. Maybe he'll crush it. Yeah. And, and don't be afraid of it. You, you're not going to guard him, but if he brings everybody down from within like he's done us, then then you, you kind of let it go. Um, that I had a list of teams that there's no way he's going to get traded to X. I didn't think he'd get traded to Cleveland. I didn't think there's anything – that, that that would make him get traded to New England, and and I don't know that that's happening anymore. I think the way he has been, he's capable of being traded anywhere, and I don't think the Steelers are afraid of that. But I also think the value of him has gone substantially down. I think they could have easily gotten a one from everybody in this draft except for maybe the top five pick guys, and I. I think that that has that has fallen. I well, think, a lot, yeah, yeah, a lot of people are very hesitant on it now. Like it, it never helped matters that he walked out on his team when they were vying for a, a playoff spot. I don't know. I don't know that I, I. Here's the thing: I was on Brown's side in this argument all along because the Steelers have hitched their wagon, and their their GM has come out and said, "We have one leader in our locker room." Yeah, and it is. Ben Roethlisberger, and Which when you're willing crazy. to put your eggs in that basket, with my opinion of that guy, nope, I'm on everybody's side but theirs. I'm with you. But with Antonio's, you Antonio's hurt it quite a bit. He's got just as much, to, maybe not as much, but uh, but he's he's at fault a lot, and uh, I think he's hurt his value. I, I think I agree with you. Uh, before I get to the combine. Yahoo Sports just had something come across. We're recording. It's 427 
uh, on Tuesday afternoon, March 5th. I'm curious your thoughts on this. Uh, NFL Network's Charlie Casserly uh, just came out and said comments from teams on Kyler Murray was the worst that he has ever heard. Uh, wow. Yeah. So what they're saying is – Do we have any of those comments? Uh, they're saying – let's see. Hold on. Or just that um, they're really bad. Casserly started his comments on Murray by saying he better hope that Cliff Kingsbury takes him number one because this was not good. Uh, leadership, not good. Study habits, not good. The board work, below not good. Not good at all in any of those areas and raising major concerns about what this guy is going to do in the league. I mean, that's about wow. as bad as you can get. Like, it, it doesn't surprise me because of the interviews and whatnot he was doing during Super Bowl week. You know, if you were going to do those things in those interviews, I, I would not have even gone to do them. Um, but in one – so you've seen this guy in front of uh, the media before, and he's never been good at that. But now he's not a good interview either. Like, he's obviously insanely skilled, right? Like, he's an incredible talent. But at the quarterback position, you need somebody that can be a leader and that can take charge of the locker room, right? Yeah. So at, at Oklahoma, I wonder if maybe their leaders were not Kyler. The leader was, you know, an offensive lineman or, or another player. It, I mean, is that – do you kind of get the feeling on that? Like, I mean, maybe that's what's going on here? 100% agree with that. I don't think that he was the leader of those locker rooms. I mean, I absolutely think it was defensive seniors and or offensive linemen, things of that nature, that were, that were upperclassmen. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little surprised by this. Like, I, the, the board work thing I, I was really surprised with because as, as so well as he played. There's a part of me that wonders we are getting – Up, oh, hang on, I lost you. Have you got me yeah, back? I'm bad. There we go. I I got you back now. No. Still here. <laughs> All right. Sorry so, about that. I don't know. I don't know if you went into my end and started lagging pretty bad. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, it's Wi-Fi. There is a part of me that, in this point in time in the season, I call this, you know, pants on fire season. This. Right. I don't know what you're <laughs> Are you good now? Oh, we lost Chris. We'll see if he comes back in. Either way, uh, the Kyler Murray news, I was a little shocked by. Um, at this article is just uh, out there. Just out there. Really – Really crazy stuff. Um, go over to Yahoo Sports. Check that out. Do what you do. Uh, let's see if we can get. Let's see if we can get Chris back in here. All right, we got Chris back in here. Uh, we'll close out with with one question. So we were talking about Kyler Murray. Let's talk about another undersized quarterback. Uh, well, and and a guy that maybe isn't really a quarterback. At the NFL Combine this week, and you and I will talk more Combine next week as we, uh, as we go along, Trace McSorley was asked to work out with defensive backs, uh, but he declined. Nick Fitzgerald at Mississippi State, he was asked to work out with tight ends. Now, Fitzgerald, never been great at throwing the football. He's the SEC's all-time rushing leader at quarterback. Uh, McSorley, he told him, look, I'm a quarterback. That's what I do. We haven't heard as much outrage over this as we did over Lamar Jackson. How do you feel about, about them asking these guys to try out in different spots? Um, I'm okay with them asking, and I'm okay with the ones who want to decline and just say I'm a quarterback with them saying I'm a quarterback and I'm rolling the dice on here. It's their choice. It's absolutely their choice. And if a team drafts them, great. 
And if a team says, I'm taking him off my board because I don't see him as a quarterback and I want him to be a, a tight end or a DB or whatever they want him to be, that's their choice too, but we shouldn't kill the guy. We shouldn't say, well, he doesn't love football enough. He didn't – whatever. Let him do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Last, uh, year, last year, Lamar Jackson got a lot of crap because he refused to work out with wide receivers and said, I'm a quarterback. Well, you know what? The dude's a damn quarterback. He made the playoffs this year. He took that bust-ass team that they had, and Joe Flacco, a former Super Bowl MVP, couldn't do anything with, and he led him to a playoff. Uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, let, me, let me bring this up. It was a comparison I saw on Twitter earlier. Uh, there was a former GM, and I, don't, I do not remember which one said it, said Trace McSorley could absolutely be the next Julian Edelman. You agree with that? Uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, and, and that's just one of those things where he could be or he could choose, I'm not going to do this, and, and I want to be a quarterback, and that's it. But if he's willing to take that role, here's the thing that we don't understand. They might have all the athletic ability in the world to run the routes, do the things. Have we seen these people catch a football? No. You can't just wake up. There's a reason that Usain Bolt never tried out for the Dallas Cowboys, okay? He might be the fastest guy on the planet. But if he can't catch a football, it does not matter. Agreed. All of those other abilities are matter at all. Well, that's why the it, combine is, is kind of ridiculous in and of itself, right? Like DK Metcalf runs a 4-3-3-40. Yep. But, I mean, there was a reason why A.J. Brown was the guy at Ole Miss. Yeah, like, some of that reason was injury. Some of it. Very it, – look, it, it, before gonna, he was we're injured – We're going to disagree though, on this. Before he was injured, it was still A.J. Brown. I, like, I, Metcalf I, is, is great. Like, he's, he's a good wide receiver. I don't think that he's a first-round wide receiver. We're, we're just going to disagree. And that's okay. We can do that's that. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he can catch the football just fine. I think he's got crazy speed. His flaws are he's not the best route runner. I, right. can, teach you, I can teach you to run routes better than I can teach you to catch footballs. Yeah, you know what I can't teach? teach? I can't teach that size and that speed, baby. No, you got that right. What is he, like 6'4"? No. And that size. He yeah. Like, He's a monster. He's, he's massive. That is a massive individual. He's 6'3". He's only 6'3", but he's, he's 223. And, and he the, – the picture of him that's floating around the internet right now is real. He's yeah. just a beast. He absolutely is. All right, we're going to wrap that up. Uh, you and I will talk more combine uh, next week as we go along. I'm sure there will be more college football topics for us to discuss. We'll also talk a little college basketball next week because the regular season will be done. We'll be heading into conference tournaments. We're getting ready for March Madness. Again, March 21st, March 22nd, we will be at Samstown Casino in Tunica. Come and hang out with us. We're broadcasting live at 10 a.m. both days and before the afternoon slate both days. Uh, that'll be on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you want to come out, be in the crowd, hang out with us. We're going to be there all day both days, and we're spending the night on Thursday night. So make sure you come out, get your rooms, come and enjoy yourselves. Uh, Chris, we will talk again next week. I'm out. You still got me at all. I, t I got you a little bit. <laughs> all right, we'll talk next time. <laughs> Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.